Hello, everybody. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, no Ogawa. <laughs> How's the weekend, sir? We thank God, though. We are looking sir. fresh. You say what? We are looking fresh. So, if you say so, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, uh, we will follow our regular method, which is basically I conduct my lecture. If we have network issues, if Prof is still around, he will assist in coordinating the lecture. If he's uh, gone to one of his many, uh, many busy activities, then the class rep will help in coordinating until I can get back online so that we don't just have dead air during the period of any disconnections we may have. I hope that is understood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now can someone give us a little reminder of what we did last week? It doesn't have to be in depth. It could just be the headings of what we did last week before we start with today's lecture. Um, we talked about the positivist school of um, Jewish students and the fact that Jeremy Bentham is the father of the school. And he stated that law is what the legislature enacts and um, is criticized for narrowing um, the, the meaning of law to, um, to narrow law to its form. Yeah. And then we also talked about um, John Austin and, and Kelsey as well. OK, thank you very much. Anybody who has anything else to add? Yeah. Go on, please. Yeah. Oh, everybody is airing the mask. OK, maybe I just uh, give you a few sentences. We talked about the positivist school, and we uh, gave you the reason why they were also called analytical jurists. And we said Jeremy Bentham basically popularized the school with his principle of utility. And we also understood, we, we talked about the fact that the fact that someone belongs to one school does not mean that he cannot uh, propound theories that can be related to other schools. So for somebody like Jeremy Bentham, he will be seen both uh, because of his principle of utility, he will be seen both as a positivist and in the same vein as a sociological uh, jurist. Now, we went further to talk about um, his principle. We gave certain uh, phrases that basically encapsulated the principle. We talked about um, the principle of pleasure and pain, principle of utility, principle of um, the hedonistic calculus. And then we said some also call it philosophic calculus, basically in terms of calculating pain before you do whatever it is you are going to do. And then eventually when we do sociological school, which we may start today, if we finish our historical school quickly enough, you also realize how the principle of utility uh, has a linkage with the sociological school, basically because of its because of two words, one being interest and the second one being purpose. And that is basically what encapsulates the principle of utility, uh, the principles of utility, pleasure and pain, whatever it is, or whatever other words you call it. Then we went there onwards to John Austin and John Austin's idea. We brought um, a diagrammatic representation of his ideas when he talked about law properly so-called and law improperly so-called. And we went through the whole, the, the whole uh, process of what it meant and why there were criticisms and what he averted his mind to, what he did not avert his mind to in terms of having a much more modern 
legal system. And we talked about countries like Nigeria that have bicameral legislatures. You have other some countries that have tricameral legislatures where there's a, a, a clear division in terms of which uh, legislature, is it the state legislature, is it the municipal legislature, is it the national legislature that, uh, that has specific powers to do specific things. And that because of that, the whole idea of having a sovereign becomes a little bogus because you can't have uh, his conception of sovereign is one mighty sovereign somewhere in, a, the, in the military way that does not even have to answer to the rules that he, uh, that he has set, his so-called command. And in looking at that, we also came to the, we obviously talked about things like constitutional conventions, international law, and the place of customary law in his theories, right? Then we went on to Hans Kelsen, and we discussed Hans Kelsen in terms of having something you call a pure theory of law, law that was encapsulated and was unique in itself, laying specific emphasis on the law that is and not the law that ought to be, and says that law does not need people to be studying it from the perspective of sociology, metaphysics, biology, medicine, whatever. And that the focus was supposed to be on law itself as a pure theory. Then he also talked about the, uh, one of the things he said was that there was a non-law source which originated validation of laws. And we had that little discussion about uh, the preamble to the constitution and what the original constitution said. And then we went historically, talked about the uh, Canadian constitution, for example, where the original constitution for Canada was actually enacted by the British, uh, the British Empire. So that basically covered what we had to say about um, the positivist school. But we also said that with new time, as time emerges, as time evolves, you find younger uh, theorists who may belong or not belong to this school, giving it new meaning in terms of what uh, the, the theory they propounded was. If uh, we, we talked about somebody like HLA had and then uh, Joseph Raz, his own idea of in terms of answering the question of people may not obey laws and may not obey the sovereign and all that stuff. And they said, the traditional scholar said that wasn't the concern of the positivist theories. The positivist theories was more concerned about recognition and not obedience. And then you have an evolution of those traditional theories now coming to tell you uh, people like uh, Raz and uh, Hart coming to tell you that no, in resolving that problem of obedience, the statutes actually speak to government officials and not citizens. It was citizens that had to obey and they may choose not to. But government officials are compelled to obey and to bring into effect the um, provisions of the law. So, I hope that covers what we did last week in very, the question now is if it was this short, why didn't we make it this short last week? Who wants to ask that kind of question? Me. Happily, I hope Fatima doesn't want to ask that kind of question. Thankfully, nobody wants to. So for this week, we we'll proceed with the historical school. Now, like we said, purpose use is key to jurisprudential studies. If you are studying something, there isn't a, an answer fits all uh, theory. It's always about use. What are you using this particular theory for? And when we talk about the historical school, something that is synonymous with the historical school is customary law. Now, when you think about customary law, what comes to your mind? Can someone help us? Uh, 
Okay. So. Old age, old age practices. Old age practices. Say so one person. Somebody else. Uh, um, in my own opinion, I believe they are from um, traditions and practices of the people who have lived together over a period of time. Where do you come from? I'm from Kwara State, sir. Have you, when last did you go to your village? Oh, yeah, just marooned in Ilari here. <laughs> um, I do go there often. It's not, I'm from Ofa and I'm based there. So that's where I live. Okay, and you have a connection with the customary law there, or uh, customary laws? Well, I can't really think of any, like, I can't remember any of their customary laws now. It's just a normal Yoruba community. It's, I don't know. Would you say that, you know, if there's something called the national, if of our the nation, Will something be there that you consider to be a national consciousness? Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, I can't. I didn't pick your last question, sir. Okay. Would you consider offer to have something called a national consciousness? If, oh. assuming you consider yes. yourself a nation. Yes, 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 I would. I, I can remember some things that are peculiar to us as a community. And such, I feel such as the Jakadi, it's something they um they do almost very often and then it's it's been an age-long practice. And then um some other things. Okay, I'll take that from you because I had that I had my dean talking about the Jakadi too. <laughs> uh, weeks ago. <laughs> okay, now there's a reason we asked some of these questions and it will be integral to some of the discussions we are going to be having. So let me put my slide on and then we continue and try to stay as close to the slides as we can. Now, we said the natural law school were probably the most known and perhaps the first jurisprudential school known to man because they came from ancient times, periods in Greek uh, history and in Roman history. People like Aristotle, people like um, all the Asian scholars were basically, most of them were uh, spewing out natural law sentiments in terms of having a natural reason, natural logic, things that uh, systems of law that were universal that could be practiced by everybody and having theories. You know, we talked about theories traveling well and those specific theories were supposed to travel well across the, the universe. And to a large extent, some of them have because when you look at your chapter four of the constitution, most of the things there are rose from the whole idea, of, uh, Hugo Grotius's whole idea of having a social contract between the governed and the government. And you find that social contract encapsulated in terms of fundamental human rights inside the chapter four of our constitution. And then again, chapter two for directive um, uh, directive principles and all that. Now, these were basically the work of people with, of scholars with a naturalist sentiments. Now, but part of the problem were with um, the natural law school was because of the preponderance of opinion of the natural law school scholars at the time, there was resistance from a lot of other scholars. Now the positivist scholars were key to that resistance. And they also came as one of the major uh, contradictions in terms of views and uh, theories that they postulated with the natural law. So while they were there as antagonists to the natural law idea, they also set themselves up to also become rivals to emerging schools who looked at the two schools as the, as the two main schools. 
Now, in present times, the positions of some of these schools have changed. I'm not sure people look at positivism with the same eye that they looked at them about 30, 40 years ago. I'm not sure people look at natural law school with the same uh, eye, for lack of a better word, in the way they looked at them some years ago. Why? Because there has been evolution in the world and things are constantly changing. And theories have been reassessed and reanalyzed in terms of whether they help with the present situation or not. And then taking a look at how far newer theories who carry the world. And you have to also remember what we said last week in terms of thinking. The rest of the world are thinking and they are thinking in terms of philosophy. Everything that comes into play has a philosophical background to it. They don't do, uh, people in civilized countries, some in Africa, some in Europe, some in the Middle East and whatever, don't do things randomly. Now, Against the background of these two schools, the positivist school and the naturalist, uh, the, the natural law school, was the historical school that also came into being. And they took a look at the natural law sentiments. Now, you had, and it started in Germany. There were arguments and discussions relating to whether there should be codification of laws in Germany. People looked at it and thought, okay, and that, that was against the background of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution, the impact of the French Revolution was sweeping across the whole of uh, Europe. And we had people and scholars who were afraid that there could be an introduction of the French way of making laws into their several uh, jurisdictions. So there was that resistance. And people at the forefront of if there was codification, and people at the forefront of codification, people like Professor Herbert of Hindenburg University were seriously interested in there being codification, which was how uh, Carvan Savigny came and wrote a book of the vocation of uh, ages for legislation or something, and came to the conclusion that codification that the German society was not developed enough for codification. And part of it was the fear that this codification was going to come using the French, uh, the, the French template for codification. While a lot of the historical um, scholars at the time supported if there was going to be an eventual codification then perhaps against, it should come against the Roman style of uh, codification. Now, the Carvon Savigny basically stated that there was no need for codification. And he said that, let me ask this question. Why do you think he said there was no need for codification? With the knowledge of, the general knowledge you have about national law, uh, natural law, uh, theories now and specifically the positivist school. Abu Karim. Professor, I think the reason why you said the customary law should not be codified is the fact that if customary law is codified, it will have, it will have the nature of legislation which will be very difficult to amend and it will be dynamic as it is out to note. Fantastic. It will turn into legislation. Legislation is what Jeremy Bentham said, uh, law is whatever the legislature enacts. The apex, the highest form of lawmaking, according to the positivists, was legislation. And this came as a complete affront to the ideas of the positivists in terms of we do not need legislation here. Why? Because there are certain things that we will lose if we, uh, that, that there will be, uh, our evolution will be truncated by legislation. We will not be able to get a complete connection with our people if we uh, codified. 
I hope that is understood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Von Savigny's criticism of Professor Harbert of Hindenburg University basically started the historical school in Germany. Obviously, across Europe, there were also some historical uh, scholars that had similar ideas. And we'll talk about one of them, Henry Main, after this. And then you see the differences in, in these ideas. Now, we said he wrote a paper titled The Vocation of Our Age for Legislation and Jewish Students, which was published in 1813. And he described law as emerging from the customs and the conscience of the people. And for lack of a better word, what he called the national consciousness was called vos Jews. And most writers prefer to just use the word vos Jews for one simple reason. Why? Because the idea of a national consciousness itself, which is an English phrase, does not capture all the requirements of the word Vogue's gist. Now, that happens a lot with local languages. There are a lot of languages in my place that when someone tries to translate into English, it's just like a bastardization of that particular local phrase. And in this case, it's probably the same thing. I don't understand German. Now, most scholars prefer to just use the word Vogue's gist. Now, what he said basically was that in another developed society like Germany, codification could not serve the purpose of the people. And his thesis basically stated, we'll go through it one by one. He said, law is the product of unconscious growth. Any lawmaking should therefore follow the path of historical development. Does anybody see any problem with this? Because what we are trying to teach each other is, you know, we said every word, every sentence is alive. Nothing is impeachable. Uh, every theory is impeachable. Nothing is set in stone. So my thinking is the moment he came with that first statement, some people will reason and think, can this be right? Who has those apprehensions? Okay, I think law isn't always a product of unconscious growth. Sometimes it's a conscious effort. Like sometimes law can even not just be looking at the past, but be looking at the future and is thus conscious in its growth or evolution or in making process, something like that. Thank you very much. That was exactly what I wanted. The, the way you people grumble about uh, jurisprudence, somebody will scream and uh, shout and throw tantrums. Each time you answer questions, you give fantastic answers. OK, Toby. Um, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, good morning. I'm actually it's Daniel, not Toby, sir. <laughs> you said what? Uh, my name is Daniel, not Toby. Oh, okay. Um, I see Toby's. Um, <laughs> we are together. So. Up on phone. <laughs> yes, sir, we are together, but not together like that. Okay. <laughs> now I understand. You are sharing the terminal. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, go on. Uh, okay, sir. I don't know, but I think I have, I would maybe, in a way, agree with um, Professor Albert with his statements that law is a product of unconscious goods. That would be uh, Calvin Savini. Oh, okay, sir. I, I guess that means it up. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, okay, sir. The reason why I said that is, um, in a way, um, if you are going to be making any law or any particular thing, before you would come to a stage of thinking about it consciously, it would be some um factors that you probably did not consciously put into place that will engineer the process for you to start thinking about it del deliberately. So for instance, if we would, for instance, talk about um, the karma now that was probably, that, that we made a new law about, it was, the, it was the factors about it, the things that we felt was wrong about it. 
it was something that happened in a way first unconsciously, then it became conscious, then it led to another change in law. So I believe that there are some factors that you might not necessarily think about, but it will in a way trigger, it will start the process of thinking about it consciously. That's just my opinion, sir. Okay. Now, if you are thinking about unconscious, I think it's always key to think in terms of the backdrop of customary law. Mm. Are there customs that led to change in the karma? Oh, sir, is that a question for me, sir? It's for you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, any, sir. Are you are not? I'm not personally aware of any, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Why I wanted to ask you that was just so that we can be focused on number one, we're talking about customary law and customary practices. Okay, sir. Uh, so the question has to be answered against the backdrop of that. Okay, sir. Now, when we talk about law is the product of, product of unconscious growth, any law making should therefore follow the path of historical development. What some of the criticisms might be that someone is tight, take Africa, for example, a lot of societies in Africa are wanting to move forward. Why? Because technology has changed things, international commerce, banking, financing, a lot has changed. And then when you are talking about an unconscious growth, what exactly, how does customary law, for example, assist you with some of these developments? And will your lawmaking be tied down to old ways and old traditional ways of doing things when you need to move into the next, um, we are doing things. And those things are already beckoning to you. We need rules in respect of it. I'll give you an example. The evidence that came out and uh, had uh, sections that were dedicated to uh, introducing digital evidence in court, right? Mm 